The days between the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and the day of Pentecost, those 50 days, were a transformative time for the early band of disciples. And that was no more evident than it was in the life of Peter the Apostle. Peter, of course, had his struggles during the ministry of Jesus uh, just prior to the crucifixion. Uh, Peter was challenged by a slave girl and denied the Lord uh, three times. But yet, by the time we reach Pentecost, following the resurrection of Christ, Peter is boldly proclaiming the gospel as well as the rest of the disciples there. I want to share at the beginning of the lesson here some words from the sermon that day. We'll be reading from Acts chapter 2, we'll read verses 14 through 24. Acts 2, verses 14 through 24. Follow along in your own Bibles or just listen as I read these words from this bold preacher. It says, But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. <clears throat> and I will grant wonders in the sky above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. And again, I would affirm what a change in Peter's life. And here he's uh, confronting his fellow Jews with crucifying their messiah but of course he's bearing witness to the resurrection of christ as well and that changes everything i'm keying in in this particular lesson on the phrase in acts chapter 2 verse 24 right near the end of our reading there <clears throat> where it says god raised him up again putting an end to the agony of death that is if you will uh, the mission of resurrection and of course, here in context, it's likely speaking of putting, it, putting an end to the agony of death for Christ himself, because it goes on to talk about raising Jesus from the dead. So I would affirm that that's the primary case. But I would also affirm that perhaps we could attach a, an even greater, more far-reaching uh, importance to those words. Not only was the death of Jesus, not only was the agony put to an end for him, but through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, we had an overall putting of an end to the agony of death. And that would involve you and I and anyone else who puts themselves by faith into his church. You see, the primary death problem that we have and the primary death problem that God was conquering through Jesus the Messiah was spiritual death. Spiritual death is, of course, the separation from God that comes through sin. And the Bible defines it that way. This goes clear back to the beginning in Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. You know the story of Adam and Eve well, I'm sure. But as uh, God prepared though that early couple, the first man and woman created for their job of subduing the earth. Notice what is recorded in Genesis 2, starting in verse 15. It says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. 
The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. Now again, the question that bears asking there, did Adam and Eve die the day in which they uh, ate the fruit that they shouldn't have eaten? Well, the answer is yes, because God said that it would happen. So this means we're talking about spiritual death is the primary problem here. Yes, separation from the tree of life did result in physical death for them, but that's not the primary issue that is being dealt with here. Adam and Eve died in the day that they ate because it was at that point that they were driven out of the garden. God positions, read on there in Acts 2 and 3, uh, puts an angel there with a sword guarding the way to the tree of life and they were driven out of the uh, fellowship and presence they shared with God. That's spiritual death. It's what we see echoed in the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. As part of what Isaiah says there, we read these words. Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear, but your iniquities or sins have made a separation between you and God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. And we learn from that verse, of course, that we share in the death, the death spoken of of Adam and Eve through our own participation in sin, and that causes a separation between us and God. His, our sins have made a separation. That is spiritual death. And then, of course, in the New Testament, as Paul in Romans 6, verse 23, tells us that the wages of sin is death. When you sin, you die spiritually. And that's the problem, again, that God is dealing with here. I would affirm it's the primary death problem that God is rectifying, taking care of through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But it was through the work of Jesus the Messiah that spiritual death was conquered and resurrection life was assured. Praise God for what he did through the cross of Christ. It is through Christ that we are resurrected. It is through Christ that we have our spiritual separation, our spiritual death taken care of. We find it in the words of Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 4 through 6. Verses 1 through 3 of Ephesians 2, of course, Paul there speaks of the, the uh, death problem we have. But then he starts in verse 4 to talk about what God did to take care of the problem. Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 6 says, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, raised us up or made us, rather, alive with Christ, that's resurrection language, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up, there's resurrection language again, raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ. Now, you'll note there, Paul is speaking in the past tense for these people who were living and breathing at the time he wrote the letter. He's writing to living and breathing believers in Ephesus. He says, we were dead. There was a time they were dead. They couldn't be physically dead. No, we were spiritually dead, Paul says. But through Christ, God, through his great mercy and love, has made us alive, raised us up with Christ, and has seated us, all past tense, something God has done by grace through faith. In the Colossian letter, chapter 2, verses 14, 11 through 14, Paul speaks of the same thing in a little bit different words. But notice what he says to those believers in Colossae. Colossians 2, starting in verse 11, says, And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up, resurrection language, with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us and has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Again, resurrection language spoken of throughout that section 
and it's in Christ, God has dealt with that, that issue. Again, past tense, he made you alive together with him. If they had submitted by faith to God, then they have this resurrection. This idea of having canceled out the debt, certificate of debt, consisting of decrees, nailing it to the cross. It's not the old law that was nailed to the cross there, as it's so often said. What was nailed to the cross was that death warrant that we had against us through our sin. Uh, that was what Jesus took upon himself and dealt with that. Then in Colossians 3, a chapter later, verse 1, Paul says, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Once again, resurrection language. If you have been raised up with Christ, and he's speaking to the again believers here that had experienced that new life, he's telling them to continue to live in that resurrection. Going back to Romans 6, we read from verse 23 a little bit earlier. In Romans 6, verse 4, he says, Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. So we too might walk in newness of life, resurrection. It's laced throughout the New Testament. and It's available to everyone who turns to Christ. So as we're reading here and studying, it was through Jesus. The cross was the bridge between people and God to take care of this spiritual death, this separation that is so uh, devastating. Now, if you're a believer, a faithful believer in Christ, you have resurrection life now. You don't have to wait on a resurrection. If you're a faithful believer in Christ, you have resurrection life now. Resurrection life in Christ is to live eternally in this life and in the life hereafter, regardless of physical death. See, the believer, as we as affirm so often in Scripture, doesn't have any reason to fear physical death because spiritual death has been taken care of. Throughout the Gospel of John, we have uh, John the Apostle talking often about eternal life, and that's tied to resurrection, isn't it? If we have faith in Christ, then we live eternally. Notice, we're going to run through the Gospel of John here and look at several passages where John talks about this. But over and over, Jesus affirmed that those who have been raised from the dead spiritually will live eternally. In John 4, as Jesus talks to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, who had come to the well to draw water, and Jesus takes that opportunity to talk her, to her about living water that is really centered in him. He says, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. So. The Samaritan woman could drink the physical water and get thirsty again, but Jesus offers a spiritual uh, drink. He is the living water, and if you partake of that, Jesus says you'll never be thirsty again. Then in John 5, 24, hear these words. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who has sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. Now, there's present tense verbs there. Jesus doesn't say, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me will someday have eternal life and someday not come into judgment. Someday will pass out of death into life. No, he says it happens now. By faith in God, you can have eternal life and avoid judgment and pass out of death into life. It's not something you have to wait for. Then in John 6, verses 47 through 53, John 6, 47 through 53, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven, so that, no, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down of heaven out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also, which I will give for the life of the world, is my flesh, 
Then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. So not only is Jesus the living water, but he's also the living bread, the bread of life. And by faith, we, if you will, consume Jesus. This isn't a, a Lord's Supper text, as it's so often used for. Uh, a lot of the imagery is the same here. But when Jesus says, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, he's talking about putting that deep faith in him through which true life comes. And you can live forever, according to Jesus. Uh, it's affirmed over and over again. Then in John 8, verse 51, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, or if you will, have faith, he will never see death. That's true resurrection. Resurrection to life evermore. Then in John 11, 25 and 26, in context there, Jesus has come to Bethany to raise Lazarus from the dead, and he's conversing with Martha over the event and notice what jesus says to her jesus says to her martha i am the resurrection and the life he who believes in me will live even if he dies and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die do you believe this we read those words again jesus says everyone who lives and believes in me has faith in me will never die. Do you believe this? And I would ask you, do you believe this? Jesus says that resurrection was a life, resurrection life was available in the then and now, then and now and then. And by virtue of that, you can have this eternal life. A believer, faithful believer in Christ will never die. Physical death doesn't short circuit that process. You see, Jesus is the answer to our death problem. Jesus is the answer to the death problem God is trying to uh, deal with in the Bible. I like what Revelation 1, verses 17 and 18 reveals about the risen Lord. As John is getting these visions of Jesus, Jesus speaks to him in Revelation 1, and starting in verse 17, it says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. I love that phrase. Jesus has the keys of death and Hades. By virtue of Jesus' conquering of death through his own physical resurrection, Jesus now has the keys of the grave for everyone, and that's why he can offer spiritual life to all of those of faith. Uh, as we started out in Acts 2, verse 24, Jesus, through his death, burial, and resurrection, put an end to the agony of death for every believer. Don't have to agonize through that, because Jesus has the keys. Hebrews 2, verses 2 through 14, speaks of the one who had the power of death prior to what Jesus accomplished on the cross, and that was the devil. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, speaking of Christ, also partook of the same. That is why Jesus had to take on the flesh, because he had to die in the flesh to conquer our death problem. He himself likewise also partook of the same that through death, his death, he or Christ might render powerless him who had the power of death. Well, who is that? Well, the Hebrew writer goes on to say that is the devil. There was a time when the devil had the, uh, held the power of death over mankind, but that is no longer the case after the resurrection of Christ. Verse 15 says, and by virtue of what Jesus did, he might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all of their lives. As I said a while ago, there's no reason for a faithful believer to ever fear death. Now, physical death, because we have eternal life now. Finally, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. 2 Timothy 
1, rather, 2 Timothy 1, verses 8 through 10. Paul writes to that young preacher, says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me as prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Once again, the, the work of Jesus on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection has changed things fundamentally for humankind. By virtue of his death, Jesus now holds the keys of death and Hades. By virtue of his death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus now has rendered powerless the devil who held the power of death. By virtue of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, he's abolished death. And we now have life and immortality through the gospel. No longer does, do, does a faithful believer have to go to Hades and await what Jesus was going to do. Jesus has opened with the keys of death and Hades, Hades, at his, re, at his, at his resurrection. And now the faithful believer lives forevermore. As Paul said in, in one place in the New Testament, uh, you know, he, he's, he's struggling in the book of Philippians about whether I should stay and for the benefit of the believers, but he, he wanted to go and be with Christ, for that's far better. The faithful believer now is ushered into the presence of God upon death. Spiritual death has been taken care of. We have fellowship with God. We have that separation renewed or, or abolished, and we go to be with the Father. And uh, there's no fear of death in any of that. As 1 John 5, 13 says, we can know we have eternal life, and that's through Christ. Praise God for the resurrection of our Savior, and praise God for the resurrection life we enjoy presently and forever through the power of God. God bless and think about these things. Uh, thank you for listening.